when his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus said, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. And then he said, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because another friend on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And the one inside the door answers, don't bother me. My door is already locked. My children are in with, with me in bed, and I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of his boldness he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask. It will be given to you. Seek, you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. To him who knocks the door opens. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? If they, you then, are, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The word from the Lord in the house. The little girl who was learning to say the Lord's Prayer couldn't quite get out trespass and so forth. So hers came out, forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put stuff in our trash baskets. <laughs> it's an earnest prayer. It, it sounds good. But any prayer sounds good. Any prayer is a good thing. Now, sometimes we let our prayers get, we get carried away and we tell God what he's to do. If you listen to your prayers and you start saying, I pray for my sister to be healed, my uncle to be healed, my grandfather to be healed, you're telling God what he ought to do. But what, what this passage talks about is the fact that, that God gives us the Holy Spirit so that we can understand that we aren't in control. Now that's just going to damage my ego tremendously to have to admit that I'm not in control. I used to think I was back when I was young and strong and you, it's a long time ago because it was when I was good looking too. So. I used to think I could handle any any situation. Any situation. We've been married a little while, and our son was born. We had a daughter first. Now, this was kind of a wonderful thing in our family because our daughter, not that she got spoiled or anything, but was the first granddaughter after 10 grandsons for my parents. <laughs> not that she was spoiled or anything. <laughs> Not that she still isn't a little spoiled. But when our son was born, the doctor came out and said to me, your son has a complete unilateral cleft lip and palate. I had no idea what he was talking about. But when I got to see my son, I thought, it can't be. I thought I was going to be sick. And this side of his face just wasn't there. And at that moment, I probably, well, I probably wasn't at that moment. It took me a day or two to figure it out that I was no longer in charge. I had finally run up against an obstacle that was more than I was able to cope with. I, I have to admit, I was physically sick when I saw my son. It was a, I was not prepared. I was a farm kid. I didn't see things like that in my life. 
but because it happened. I had to realize that I wasn't in charge. I had to realize that there is a power to which I have to surrender. I was a farm kid. Uh, I wasn't very religious at that time. But what struck me as, as, a, as amazing was that at two months, Jay had his first surgery. And when we went to the St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago because of his surgery, we got there at 7 o'clock in the morning and our pastor was already there and he came from 125 miles away. And he beat us there. And he was just there. He put his arms around us, but he didn't say anything. He held our hands. He didn't say anything. And I thought, what's he doing? And I've since learned. He was praying really hard. Because I found myself in that same category on occasion. He never opened his mouth. He never told us what he was praying. He never mentioned what it was that he was asking God for, but he was trying to invoke for us the comfort of the Holy Spirit around us. And I know that those prayers were powerful, though I never ever found out what he said. And it doesn't make any difference what he said. Because God heard his words. God touched both of us. And gave us great relief. Now Jay was supposedly had a feeding problem because he had no rope in his mouth and they had to do that at, at I gotta remember what the major was. He had 17 operations before his 18th birthday. But his feeding problem was the fact that he couldn't get enough. <laughs> As he, as he got a little older, if he was the last one at the table, you didn't have to worry about putting leftovers away. <laughs> there weren't any. But I was so impressed with what the pastor had done. Because I, I went when I could. No, I didn't. I went when it was convenient. I admire those of you who come every Sunday, even on days when it's not convenient. Who, who come in spite of the fact that it was too hot to be here last week. But you come back because God meets you here. And God presents you with the Holy Spirit here. Jesus showed the form for the Lord's Prayer. And we come close to preaching, praying it every time we pray that prayer. He showed us a form, but what he said is, is talk to God. Remind him you know how weak you are. Remind him how much you know that he loves you. And then ask for that which you want. But don't insult him with petty things. Don't ask that it doesn't rain Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock because you're going to have a picnic. Ask God to bless the world with life-giving rain at his convenience. And if you want to mention your picnic, go right ahead. But you better invite him. <coughs> ask, it will be given. But be careful what you ask for. We all want healing for our friends. We all want healing for our families. We want all want good health and eternal life. That's what you can have. You can't live forever, but you can have eternal life. This world is going to get you sooner or later. But God's eternity is, is there just for each one of us. And so we need, to, we need to learn to pray for the things that are deeply important in our lives and in our families and in our friendships. If you go to a friend and ask him for something and he says no, your friendship doesn't end. 
But if you go and ask for something that you're in dire need of, then God's love will prevail. And God's love will provide. Not just friendship, but love. The love of the Holy Spirit. Now, we were going to sing that song one time, and I didn't tell you we might do it this morning, so we won't do it this morning. But. Welcome to my world. Someday. Someday. But it's a simple message. Knock and the door will open. Seeking you will find. Nobody finds anything without looking for it. And the amazing thing is you find it in the last place you look. Because it doesn't make any sense to look anymore, does it? Ask and it will be given. But be careful what you ask. Don't ask that which makes you more powerful, more wise, more knowing than God. Ask for His Spirit. Elijah was dying and Elisha, his, his, the one he was mentoring, his student, asked for a double portion of your faith. And Elijah said, that's tough, that's hard to do, but if it's going to happen, then I will disappear and you'll see me no more. What what kind of what kind of an answer is that? You know, I asked for something and now I gotta guess whether I got it or not. But but Elisha had to go out and live like he did have it because it looked like he might have gotten it, and if he didn't live up to the promise of the prayer that he had asked then he was the one who was letting the deal down. He was the one who was not. Now you can make a deal with God. People do it all the time. If you let her get over this, I will. And God is not impressed with our ability to live up to our promises. Our prayer should be love me and those around me, God. For we need that love. There is no substitute. There is no replacement. There is no anything that replaces his love. And Jesus said, you knock on the door and ask for three loaves of bread and your friend says, I can't do that because my kids are in bed. But if you really need something and you pray for it, it will be provided. I don't mean it's you're going to find a gold nugget in your backyard about that big. Probably not going to happen. But do you need a gold nugget about that big? I, I pray for the winning Powerball, except we Methodists don't believe in gambling much. <laughs> There was a big question. Somebody in Michigan one time won $250,000 in the lottery and wanted to give $100,000 to the church and the pastor turned it down. I could have cried. Because <laughs> we can launder money through the church and make it good. So if you win big, let me know. I will not turn you down. I'll make it work. But don't pray for a winning lottery ticket. That's not what God provides. Don't even, don't even pray for the power company to make a mistake and give you a $300 credit next month instead of a bill. That isn't what God provides. God provides what you need. Not what you want. Not what you would like not what you think you ought to have, but God's love provides what you need. So when you pray, you ask Him to fill, fulfill your needs, even if you don't know what they are. Because most of us don't set back and say, I need a double helping of the Holy Spirit. I need to be twice as faithful as I have been in the last thing. We don't do that. But that's what we ought to be praying. 
We have people on the prayer list who have diseases. I pray the same prayer list you do when I'm at home. I do not pray for, I, I, I will be honest with you, I do not pray for cures. That's up to doctors, up to God's good grace. But I ask for his presence in your life, in the lives of those you pray for, in the lives of those you care for, in the lives that we can touch. I got busy and lost count. But I started out praying for those kids we were sizing for shoes. But then we got real busy and I just said, take care of the rest of them, God. They're, on you. They're yours now. We ought to pray that we could love ourselves enough to truly love those around us. You want to throw in a word about keep me healthy? He's going to dismiss that anyway. He will heap his love upon you and maybe his love will cause a heap. I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. But I do know that unless you have a relationship with God and can express it openly in prayer, you're not going to get the comfort that you need in times of trouble. I looked at my son and almost threw up. It was like someone had hit me here very hard. And he's a beautiful kid. Because he's a he's got God in his heart and he's got God in his spirit and he loves people. And it doesn't make any difference. And the way I, I can say that because unless you knew, you couldn't possibly tell that you had it. God is great. All the time. All the time. God is great. Amen. I'm going to close this morning with the Lord of the Dance. Number 261. If you stand with me.
man dance with the Lord. There's a great one that always talks about the two footprints in the sand, and then there's only one. And he said, what about that, Lord? And the Lord said, that's when I picked you up in my arms and carried you. And further down there were footprints everywhere. And he said, what about that? And he said, that's when we danced. So dance with the Lord. Pray with him. Love him. That he might love you more. Go in peace.